Hello and welcome to Living a Culture of Life podcast by Human Life International. I'm your host, Colleen, and I'm joined today by Father Bouquet. Welcome back, Father. Well, Colleen, great to be with you one more time. It's great to have you here in the studio. Coming back from the mission field, so it's uh, it's always great to be back. Yes, it's great. To, always great to have you here. I'm excited to hear all about your mission travels. Um, we'll have to share some of them on the podcast sometime. Good. Look forward to it. Yeah. And today we're going to be talking about the new changes to Title IX, which is a subject that we did talk about two years ago when they were first introduced, but they went into effect last week, last Wednesday. So today we're going to be talking about what those changes are, how they're going to affect kids going back to school, and what our bishops have said, all the implications here. So, Father, I think a really good place to start is to just recap, what is Title IX? What was its original intention? So it starts in 1972. So in 1972, we have the uh, promulgation of uh, Title IX. And in this very simple 37 words, Colleen, dealing with discrimination against women. And so if you st think back in time, about 40 to 42 percent of our universities, colleges, were with women were enrolled. So we have a, a small, uh, in a sense, a growing percentage of population, and so there was a great need to address the, the rights and uh, of women, and not only in the school systems but also in work environments. And it's particularly it affected any institution that received federal funds, even in a minuscule amount, still had to follow the Title IX regulations. Okay, so it wasn't just public schools that were affected. It was any school, Catholic, private, anything where the students are receiving federal funds in any Correct. way? Correct. Correct. Okay. And, and it affected K through 12, mm -hmm. colleges, universities. But obviously the act also, you know, worked in the sense of work environments. So mm -hmm. anyone working in the federal government, any uh, person, particularly here in 1972, any woman working in those environments, you know, had to be treated equally as men had been treated. Okay. And that's obviously a good thing because yes. you don't want to have the discrimination between them. Has it been updated before? What's the, I know that we're going to be talking about the newest changes that have gone into effect, Correct. but do, are we going from 37 words to the new changes or have there been updates so in the middle? So with the August the 1st uh, change, now mm -hmm. we're dealing with a 701 page document. Uh, so, yes. and there have been iterations of this uh, Title IX in the sense of, of policies, executive orders, uh, you know, from 1972 going forward. You know, uh, of most recent, probably people would be more familiar what happened uh, under the Obama administration because we were also dealing with the Affordable Care Act. And I know today that we're not going to get into the health care part of our discussion in a lengthy way, but Title IX is connected to the Affordable Care Act. And actually, I brought some papers with me if we wanted to make reference if we had time. But what for people to understand is that the definition of, of sex discrimination, so how we define sex discrimination, as I said, 1972, we were dealing specifically, you know, with how women were treated in the educational system and obviously in any institution that received federal funding. Mm -hmm. and, and obviously, it had uh, effects in the, in the broader context of society. Mm -hmm. And, but under the Obamacare, it connected the definition of sex discrimination to health care. So whatever Title IX's definition of sex discrimination is, becomes the definition used in the Affordable Care Act, so in health care. Mm -hmm. So I know today we won't have a lengthy time to be able to move into that area, but you can already see the implications as we discuss how it affects education. Yeah. And you can see how it can equally affect our health care system. Well, and that's really important to talk about because all of the conversations I've seen around Title IX have been focusing mostly on how it's going to affect women's sports and women in schools right. and women's safety with like locker rooms and bathrooms. And I haven't seen anybody addressing the healthcare side of it. So I'm really glad that you're bringing that up so that our audience is aware. And we can get into that a little bit later into the conversation. Awesome. But yeah, just to have our audience be aware that we are going to be talking about that and that it is really important to be aware that this is a potential impact of the update to Title IX. So what, well, okay, actually, before we jump into what specifically changed, a lot of these changes obviously have to do with the whole sex discrimination versus gender identity, which we'll get into. But it was interesting because I was reading through the Wikipedia article before we started filming this, and it sounds like under the Obama administration, there was a, the Department of Education said that sex discrimination included gender identity, and then under Trump, they clarified that it didn't include that. And so now I think we're seeing a change to the actual text to kind of enshrine gender identity in Title IX. Is that a correct, correct. interpretation of some of these changes? And, and what's good for us, you know, uh, especially as Catholics, is to see, look toward what our bishops are saying. So, you know, one thing I would point out is under the, uh, the National Catholic uh, Educational Association, also on the U.S. Catholic Conference of Bishops website, mm -hmm. if we uh, look at, I know you're going to put a lot of these things in the show notes for people to, to, to uh, uh, become more aware 
mm-hmm. and to read because it's important, you know, to read actually what's being said uh, and not necessarily commentaries on it. So, but what they say here is very important. The bishops break down the topic. So when we understand that there uh, is, uh, and I'm going to make reference quite a bit to Bishop Burbage here today, okay. you know, in the Dar- Diocese of Arlington, because he wrote a very beautiful catechesis on the human person and gender ideology. Mm-hmm. And it fits beautifully into our discussion of mm-hmm. Title IX. Before we jump into what the bishops have said, can you clarify for our audience, like what specifically is changing? Because I touched right. on it, but I don't know enough about it to be able to explain sure. all so, the details. So, Colleen, so I think that the best thing, that, you know, Colleen, is, you know, to understand 1972, that the way that we understood sex is male, female. Mm-hmm. So 37 words, very clearly identifying what we all understood very clearly in culture, in society, science, biology, that there is only male and female. Mm-hmm. What's happened now with the uh, iteration now of the new uh, uh, promulgation of Title IX, this 701-page document, it's changed the definition of sex. And so now what we have is it's based on a self-asserting identity. So a person who identifies themselves. So regardless of their biological uh, uh, truth, that is male, female, now we're basing sex discrimination on what a person feels or identifies so our sexual characteristics or self-identification which are very fluid and so in a way we no longer understand what it means to be female and what it means to be male now this is very important because you can see how this is going to change uh, the conversation not only in our educational systems and we're going to talk about that but obviously how that also impacts our health care Mm-hmm. And so, again, we might have time today to talk about that in greater detail, but we can always come back to that. What specific areas are especially parents concerned about and what will be affected by these changes when kids are going back to school next week or in a couple of weeks? So as the bishops have pointed out in, in, in their discussions and, and also in their statements, and we know there are even no lawsuits the bishops themselves are participating in with various amicus briefs and various ways of addressing these issues, asking for clarifications and and confirming what does the language actually say. Mm -hmm. So for parents, we'll kind of start there, is to be aware Mm -hmm. because this affects all institutions of education. So even institutions that are Catholic or Christian or non-Christian schools that are run by religious institutes Mm -hmm. that may be receiving federal funding, even in a minuscule way. So now they fall under the Title IX regulations obviously affects all the public entities mm-hmm. it affects any 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 entity that is receiving federal funds so as parents to be aware of it so what is being actually taught in the school what is my child being introduced to what language is being used how does this affect the issue of privacy how does it affect the sporting programs how does it affect classroom formation textbooks uh what is the teacher actually saying you know are children being referred to by the, the pronouns or or non-binary language in, in the classroom parents need to be aware because Many times the schools do not communicate with the parents. We see this in some of the states that have now have lawsuits pending because parents were not told what their children were being taught. And, and as a result, parents were kind of in the dark. So it's time for parents to awaken you know, to what is Title IX. I'm not obviously asking everyone to read 701 pages unless you really want to read them, <laughs> but to read solid commentary. And, and I would there I would turn to the bishops, turn to your local bishops, mm-hmm. you know, who are in, in states that maybe are dealing with this in a much more uh, aggressive manner, uh, like in California, New York, you know, Illinois, uh, several states where they're pushing this so quote unquote woke environment. It's good for parents to be alert. Mm-hmm. I believe it also is um, potentially going to impact restrooms and locker rooms and like you mentioned to pronouns like teachers being obligated to use the pronouns that a student identifies with and I also saw right. that it's going to affect on the flip side sexual assault the due process of the law for sexual assault cases Correct. it puts people at risk of unjust accusations or not going through the proper channels Correct. Um, and I don't know enough about that to know exactly what those changes are I just saw that that was one concern people right. were raising is that they were afraid that people would be unjustly accused. And so that's the other side, on especially college level, affecting men. People are focusing very strongly on how this will affect women and women's sports and women's safety, but just also to be aware that there is this flip side Correct. for men. And the bishops actually in, uh, talk about this in many of their documents and also in some of the legal challenges. Mm-hmm. You know, what is harassment? What do we, again, 
what do the terms mean? Mm -hmm. So, and maybe that's where we can, you know, turn now just to kind of look at some of the impacts of that. So you just made note of a classroom. So mm -hmm. let's look at a science teacher. You know, we, we talked about this yesterday, you know, just kind of preparing ourselves for our podcast. And, you know, if you're a science teacher that's teaching the truth about biology and anatomy, and so now in this particular environment, you know, where, you know, you're actually said, you know, to reject your understanding of human anatomy and human biology and human genetics, mm -hmm. where we're dealing with an XX and an XY chromosome. And what does this mean? And what does that say about the human person, whether they be male or female? You're saying to a science teacher, you can't teach that, mm -hmm. you know, or you have to reject that truth. So, so it has the potential then to not just affect like the culture of the classroom, but the actual content and the substance that is correct. being taught. That's in correct. a science class. And as, as Bishop Burbage talks yes. about and our bishops talk about, it's also that you're asking me now as that teacher to participate in an untruth. So, and that's a, that's very important because, you know, it's, it's, it's a matter of that you're asking me to do something that is false, to falsify a truth, to reject an obvious and a, and a common sense truth that each of us can discern very easily, you know, one through a genetic test, but just two even from observation. And as Bishop Burbage in his document very beautifully does, he outlines our understanding. And I think that's really what's important as Catholics is our approach to this conversation. Mm -hmm. It's not the message of the public. It's not the message of the government. We have a very different message and a different way of approaching our conversation about these issues. Well, and obviously the church upholds the dignity of the human person, which means that we're against discrimination, unjust discrimination. What is the church's actual teaching on discrimination and how does it fit into this conversation? Right. So when you look at, the, when again, we start with the human person, mm -hmm. male and female. So and so from that starting point and how how we relate to each other as male and female and there's a there's a truth about the human person about being male and about being female and and so when that truth is rejected which happens with gender identity confusion mm -hmm. and also it happens in this very relativistic culture that tries to object an objective norm. Mm -hmm. And so what do we have? We have a falsification. So as, as Catholics, we approach the human person from a, a, a basic truth that God made us male and female, mm -hmm. made the human person male, female. So in this understanding, then it, it affects how we relate to each other, how we interact with each other. It governs our laws, our, our way of approaching uh, discussions that affect human persons, whether it be in marriage or whether it be in the single state or whether it be in science, like we talk about in vitro fertilization or contraception or abortion. And so it affects the way that we speak. Why? Because we're dealing with a human person who is made in the image and likeness of God, who has an inherent dignity. And what we're saying in this identity confusion dysphoria mm -hmm. is that we're trying to deny that objective truth. So what the bishops are making very clear, and Bishop Burbage, Burbage does a very good job of, of saying that people accuse us of you know, being discriminating or discriminatory against certain people because of their self-identification, which is actually false. You know, and Bishop Burbage particularly, you know, says that as people who adhere to the teachings of the gospel, bullying or uh, degenerating someone by using uh, bad language or making fun of them in any way is unacceptable. It's, it's not rooted in the gospel. And as Christians, this is not how we respond. At the same time, we also don't uh, participate in a false compassion, a false sense of charity, and reject an obvious truth and participate in an untruth. That would go against the gospel as well. So, so understanding that helps us to be able to ask the question, what do you mean by sex discrimination? Mm -hmm. So if you mean in any way that male or female is bullied, mistreated uh, indifferently uh, than the law would say, or as, as people of the gospel, as the gospel would have us you know, uh, to approach, then yes, we, we are obviously not in favor of that at all. We would not never condone that. Mm -hmm. But if you're asking me and telling me that to participate in a falsification of a truth, I can't do that. In good conscience, I can't do that. So now we're dealing with conscience rights. Now we're dealing with parental rights. Now we're dealing with the inherent dignity of the person themselves, you know, who is struggling with an identity confusion, which as bishops have clearly stated in all of their documents, that we know that the Psychiatric Association and many others have addressed this issue. We're rejecting what we know in order to promote uh, really a false understanding of the human person. Mm -hmm. And so that affects harassment. 
because what do you mean by harassment? Mm -hmm. You know, if harassment is that I'm not participating in this falsification, that's not harassment. You know, so and also in our Catholic school systems, let's just say that some who are receiving either state or federal funding, in this case, particularly federal funding. Mm -hmm. What does that mean in the school system? You know, when we say there will only be male and female restrooms, that male and female sports only, or we are actually protecting the privacy of women, or young girls, young men, boys in, in the bathroom settings or in the locker rooms. You know, what does that say? That's, that's not harassment. Mm -hmm. You know, we're acknowledging a truth that, that there is only male and female and that this is what we are, we are responding to. And so it starts with this understanding of the human person, Colleen. And, and of course, in the public forum, that's not the starting point. Mm -mm. And you can see now where the, where, the, where the difficulty and where the challenges lie, especially as Christians. Mm -hmm. And even our Jewish brothers and sisters, depending on where they are in the country, are raising questions as well. And we also have the same thing within the community of Islam. So, you, you, you know, so all these questions are being posed, raised, you know, and saying, what do you mean? Now, once we know what they mean, because even in a 701 page document, a lot of ambiguity, Colleen, a lot of confusion, you know, a lot of terms being used, but nothing explained. What do you mean by this? What, how was the implication of that? So like I used about the science teacher. Yeah. What is, what, how do you want me to deal with that? It seems like you're taking something which is good, which is making sure that people aren't discriminated against or they're not bullied or they're not harassed and using it to push an agenda, like kind of twisting the meaning and pushing an agenda. So on the one hand, right. you don't want to say you're 100% against it because you don't want children struggling with this to be bullied or harassed. Exactly. But at the same time, affirming what their like self-identity isn't necessarily actually upholding the good of the human person. So being able to navigate through the challenges that are being posed through right. this and make sure that it's clear that we're making sure that people aren't being treated like a manner that doesn't align with their dignity as a human person, right. but at the same time, you're not affirming an untruth. Right, and having, you know, before working here at HLI and serving HLI's mission, I was in diocesan ministry and parish ministry and many times in Catholic school systems. Mm -hmm. We had a very clear, you know, vision, you know, and which included how we treat other people. And so these were very, very strong statements that were clearly taught to not only to the students, but to the faculty, to the administration, to the parents, you know, that this is how we approach these various conversations. And, and, we, and we're not ashamed of that. We, we, you know, we have very strong religious beliefs and we have very strong principles that we adhere to mm -hmm. and we don't compromise them. And as Bishop Burbage, which again, I love how he addressed, he says, and there could be a gradual, in other words, I'm not gonna participate in, in, a, in a lie or in a deception. At the same time, you know, it may take me time to address the issue, to, to come at the issue. So it is also the church's balance and how she's addressing these and realizing that we live in a very pluralistic society. Mm -hmm. We have to function within that society. How do we do that? While at the same time being very respectful to what we believe and what we adhere to. And, and that's where, again, the challenges remain. In the world, but not of it. <laughs> right, exactly. Very beautifully stated. And, 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 and what, I, what I, again, love reading various amicus briefs, reading some of the, the statements of the bishops. And I think just for our audience, if I may put a comma, is uh, sometimes our, our Catholic families don't realize how heavily involved our bishops are. You know, relying upon the expertise of those in the various disciplines, you know, to address these issues. And when you read any of their statements, you get a very clear picture of the bishops, one, theological teaching, doctrinal teaching, but you can also see and hear the language of other experts coming to this, and a lot of documents, footnotes after footnote after footnote, quoting various documents and, and articles and scientific articles and journals, showing exactly what we understand and know, and how, very sadly, we're rejecting it. And all, as you just said a while ago, Colleen, to advance an ideology a falsification and a very harm. And I think that, you know, people are afraid to call it harmful. These are harmful to individuals and harmful to society. And you can see what Title IX has done to confuse this conversation and now flip that over into healthcare. And you can see how it, it just magnifies the problem ever the more, because now we're dealing with the physical transformation or the chemical transformation of human beings into something that is not true. Well, and it seems like it's just like undoing what Title IX was originally supposed to do, because if you can have any male identify as a female and get female benefits, that's not actually protecting women from 
un, like unjust discrimination. That's simply letting men, or I guess you could go the other direction, but usually it's men play the system to try to get ahead because usually you have men trying to get into women's locker rooms or women's bathrooms or women's sports. sports. And so it, it's just like, it's, um, I think Riley Gaines had a quote where she said, how can you defend what you cannot define? And I've said something similar the first time that we filmed this episode of if you can't define what a woman is, you're not able to protect her from unjust discrimination. Exactly. Exactly. Well said. Well, and perfectly said. And, and also, in, when you think about, the, you know, how does this now relate to the issue of pregnancy? So if we just stretch this mm -hmm. and think about the protections that Title IX originally set out to do. Mm -hmm. And in that 37 word document, and that is so for a, a woman who maybe isn't in a work environment and she's pregnant, what kind of leave, what kind of health care, what kind of benefits, what kind of protections to her job are, are there? How do we, you know, make sure that she is being equally treated or if something is not equal anyway, maybe there's something wrong on both sides of the equation. How do we correct that? You know, how do we have maternity, maternity leave, paternity leave? You know, what, how does that all affect? So. Also, in, in the sense of the work environment, let's say that she has a medical leave, not because she's pregnant. Mm -hmm. How is she treated? You know, so these are these things were very important in 1972 mm -hmm. uh, when we were seeing more and more women coming into the educational systems and uh, into the work environment. And so now move forward in time, those same things still exist. And you just articulated it so beautifully that if I cannot understand what it means to be male and female, and, and look at the confusion that, you know, that, that this is going on, you know, and what pronoun, no pronoun, you know, uh, today it's one thing, tomorrow is another thing. Then you look at the, the ramifications of these surgical manipulations and the, and the long-term consequences or the hormonal blockers and the very fact of what that does in the long term and the harm being done. And what we see in other countries, them turning back the tide of this, mm -hmm. stopping it, you know, putting a halt on all this seems in the United States, we're just all gung-ho, just let's keep moving the train forward no matter what. Wow, places like Europe, like the Travis Stock Clinic in England and other places in Europe, they're actually walking back and stopping this and trying to protect minors from exactly. these surgeries exactly. and hormone blockers. And, and, and I think that she's just the, when, as we look at this, and that's, again, I love about how our church approaches it, uh -huh. because it's always looking at a, an objective truth. And then working from that truth and anything that works against that truth is something that we would oppose, but we in this situation we need some clarifications. So as we saw now in, in the new uh, iteration of this document, on oh, now 701 words, the issue of pregnancy itself. I brought it up just a little while ago, mm -hmm. but there it equates pregnancy with abortion in in, in the sense of our lactation or other things. And you're thinking, wait a minute, this is a very different act. You know, mm -hmm. abortion is an intentional killing of a human being. Mm -hmm. So pregnancy is 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 what it is, and that is carrying child to be with child, and there should be the protections, you know, that are that you, we've just been talking about. But to equate this to abortion, or as some of the language gets into Colleen, is neutral environments, neutral zones, and schools, and so we have states right now that uh, have very strong anti-abortion, you know, laws. Mm -hmm. and are protecting human life and protecting women from the violence of abortion, protecting yeah. families and society. So what happens in those school systems that now receive federal funding? How does Title IX affect their language? I'm still confused about how the abortion thing plays into it. What does it mean? Like, why is putting it on the same level as pregnancy a problem? And how will that practically play out in like the schools so it, it, as as i read as i understand okay so it, it seems simply that, that basically a, uh, under the title nine mm -hmm. a person cannot be denied access to abortion nor can be told they have to have an abortion or it's they have to be free in their decision making even though there's no constitutional right to abortion mm -hmm. but under title nine you know where in those states where abortion is legal mm -hmm. and I would, that's the question what happens in the states where it's not how does yeah. title nine impact that and so basically what is done is it's just put it on an equal level of conversation about discrimination mm -hmm. because you know discrimination against a woman because she's pregnant or because maybe she lost a child through miscarriage, or be, maybe because um, she uh, wants to have more children. You know, you're discriminating against her. That was unacceptable. Mm -hmm. And we would all agree with that. That's just unacceptable behavior. Yeah. And we also would agree that you don't want to force a woman to have an abortion. That's correct. And to, but to, to raise abortion into this conversation mm -hmm. uh, on an equal par with discrimination, 
Okay. Is a, is, a, is 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 it's it not only is it wrong, but it's a lot of confusion about what do they mean by that. Okay, so it, me being confused is other oh, people yeah. being well, confused. Well, there are a lot of people well. confused because I've been reading. Just I was trying to understand it myself, mm -hmm. and it's just the vagueness of it. Even you know, reading some of the amicus briefs, reading some of the statements. You know, uh, I mean, I understand what they're saying, but it, I find it still somewhat confusing. Okay. You know, it, 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 and the idea that you know, I mean, from the Biden administration's point of view. Mm -hmm. who has been advocating for abortion on demand. The whole Democrat party, you know, stands on this principle, all right? So it's not, I should not be surprised that they're not gonna find a way to bring it in to the Title IX conversation, mm -hmm. and it has. So so that in itself is is a problem, you know, right? And so like we were saying earlier, is a lot of the um, talk around this has been surrounding sports. Can you talk about how specifically, especially with abortion, this is gonna impact Catholic hospitals to the Affordable Care Act, because that was a point that you were bringing up, and I just want to kind of highlight the seriousness of this. Right. So whether we're talking about, uh, you know, gender identity confusion and mm -hmm. a request for some type of surgery to alter the phys physiology of a, of a person, or whether we're talking about the issue of abortion, contraception, in vitro fertilization, uh, you know, these issues that are affect all of our Catholic institutions, you know, need to uh, uh, be aware of what Title IX is saying, because by identifying sex discrimination or equating it with gender identity confusion, you know this this uh, self assertion, this self identity. That's 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 where the dangers lie now. In our Catholic institutions, which cannot participate in any of these evils, any of these immoral acts. So what happens when the hospital is receiving some type of federal assistance, mm -hmm. some type of a federal aid, whatever the programs may be? Now they fall under the auspice of Title IX, but not, 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 not Title IX, under the Affordable Care Act. Okay. Because as I said earlier, my understanding in paragraph or section 1557, my understanding of that section of the Affordable, uh, of, um, the, uh, Affordable Care Act is referring back to Title IX. Okay. And basically saying the definition of sex discrimination identified in Title IX is the definition that is used in the Affordable Care Act and how we approach health care. Interesting. So by having that linkage, now we have institutes being pushed. Yeah. And of course, the Biden administration uses, you know, various, you know, rulings of the courts and various documents, but you, you flip it over and you realize many others are turning in those documents on their head and saying, that's not what the document says, or we disagree with the document, mm -hmm. or what the ruling has said. And we're challenging the court to look at this. Will religious freedom be a protection for Catholic schools and Catholic hospitals right. in this situation? So the way it reads, and if you don't mind, I'm going to put my head down so a okay. little bit. So this is what it does read. The law exempts religious organizations to the extent that the application, so the entity, uh, the application of the law conflicts with their religious beliefs. Okay. So, so there is a religious exemption. Okay. All right. However, the section shall not apply to educational institution which is controlled by a religious organization if the application of this subsection would not be consistent with the religious tenets of that organization. So what it's saying that, you know, you might have entities that uh, uh, don't necessarily follow Catholic tenets. They might be a Catholic entity, but they're not necessarily educational. They're not an educational entity. And that I read that with a lot of question because it makes me wonder what about our Catholic healthcare systems? What about our nursing homes? What about our, you know, our clinics and so forth and so on? Because they are Catholic, you know, in the sense of our tenets and what we believe, but they may not be owned by the Catholic Church. They may not be owned by a religious institute. They may not be run by religious sisters or brothers. You know, they may not have a Catholic apostolate, but they're still Catholic. Mm -hmm. So it, it raises lots of questions, but ultimately they cannot discriminate or Title IX as an exemption for a religious institute. Okay. So that would be in education. So hopefully there is protection for the parents who are listening whose kids go to religious schools that they'll be able to be protected from this. I guess that depends on whether or not the school, how Catholic the school actually is, if it is Catholic in name only, if it's right. actually Catholic, because you could have schools that agree with this and will in implement it even if they are quote unquote, a Catholic right. organization. And sadly, we have examples of that, which I know we need to get yeah, into today. Yeah, we're not going to go dive but, into but that. I but I do believe yeah, just... that's, that's, a, that's a different question. What I would say that, you know, one thing that I, in reading so mm -hmm. much of the documents about this, mm -hmm. and especially from the Catholic perspective, mm -hmm. is that many of the, the those in the legal teams mm -hmm. are saying to the church, in all of your institutions, to be very clear 
in your mission statements, in your vision statements, in all of the articulations in your documents to be extremely clear. In other words, to be Catholic because that articulates don't necessarily save you from a litigation completely, mm -hmm. you know, exempt you 100%. We know the system today, but it's very clear that you, this is what you uphold. This is what you're teaching. This is the uh, what you uphold. So, for example, if someone comes seeking employment, you're not discriminating against this person because of a position they hold. That position is just not in line with your own principles and teaching. And if they're going to be an educator, that's incompatible. So these are various things that have to be dealt with. Well, and I just wanted to also just bring that up for parents listening, just like to be aware that it is a case by case basis. Like look into your school, you know, your school right. that your kids are going to the best look into what they're actually going to do and how much do you trust that school? To well, it's your textbooks. Children. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. oh, a lot of times what yeah, like you're textbooks. saying is that, you know, textbooks sometimes are being funded by either mm -hmm. state or federal funds and many, even in some of our Catholic schools. Mm -hmm. So are in our higher education, uh, uh, learn, centers of higher education. So how does this impact? What goes back to parents? And the bishops have been very clear to parents as well. Open your, uh, open your eyes, open your ears, get involved. Mm -hmm be aware. But I believe it's very important, you know, Colleen, that, that people understand not only, you know, what the new document, now, now it, law, you know, now being challenged in many states, but still it is now the federal policy. Mm -hmm. And by the Department of Education, of course, the Office of Civil Rights, all of this is involved. And you have a lot of entities driving this train forward mm -hmm. and pushing their policies and pushing because now they are they are the, the policy, they are the regulation. Mm -hmm. And despite the legal challenges, unless there's an injunction, what means they cannot implement the new iteration or iteration of, of Title IX, doesn't mean it's not there because now it's, it's really, uh, uh, pushed upon the administrators of the various school systems to adhere to Title IX requirements. Mm -hmm. So imagine all the meetings happening, all the administrators, the school boards, the various people involved on, on uh, overseeing supervisory positions. How does this get pu pulled in? Mm -hmm. And as you said earlier, and, I, I, and we want to say this, and the bishops have also said it, where the document supports a good that's good not only for individuals and groups, the common good, mm -hmm. all right, supports a good. We're not opposed to this. Mm -hmm. What we are opposed to is that which contradicts that good, which opposes that good. And for us as Catholics and as Christian, that good starts with the dignity of the human person. So anything that violates that good, mm -hmm. you know, is what we put into question. And we're challenging the federal government to be clear in its iteration. What do you mean? So back to some of the terms. What do you mean by sex discrimination? Now, we understand it because now they've clearly identified that it's associated with self-assertion, self-identification, sexual characteristics, you know, the various uh, ways in which people assert their identity, regardless of biological identity. So mm -hmm. it's separating biological identification, male, female, now making it sex discrimination based upon self-identification or sexual characteristics or behavior. And so now that's where the bishops are going to make the first challenge. Mm -hmm. And we should, because yes. that's not how we should approach this conversation. And, and as a consequence of this confusion, these are the things that have happened. So what do you mean by harassment? What do you mean by the teachers have to teach or not, cannot discriminate in a classroom? What does that mean? We gave an example of a science teacher. Or grammar. Or, do they even still teach grammar with like the different pronouns? They do. They it do. throws me off whenever I see they, them written as a singular. It, right. It, it's not right. It's not logical. <laughs> and, 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 and the difficulty, it also, it, it's harmful not only to the individual, to the student, mm -hmm. but it's harmful to the students. It causes this confusion. And obviously, no support of bullying, no support of any act of, of, of belittling any other human being, unacceptable behavior. But you can see how this confusion can, can lead to a lot of problems within these systems mm -hmm. because not everybody will understand. Not everybody is going to be sensitive. That's part of the education, the teaching we have to do, of course. And we do this. I mean, we did this in our educational systems. Mm -hmm. But as this continues to, to uh, become modified and modified and modified, it becomes so complicated that it's, it's unmanageable. Mm -hmm. It's untenable in the sense of how to reach its goal because it just doesn't make sense. And, and so I, I believe it's important for parents so as we uh, as, as you brought up, is to, to be aware, to talk to their children, 
you know, uh, uh, Bishop Burbage and other and other bishops have made it very beautifully. Parents need to sit down with their children. Yeah. Parents are the first Definitely. educators of their children. Children learn the good from their parents. They learn how it is to relate to each other as men, women, boys, girls. We, we learn this in the family. We learn this in our home environments, among our family and friends, and to talk to the children and to talk to one's adolescents and so in uh, the various ages. Parents know best, but if they start very early and begin to talk to them about this and promote a true understanding of the human person and, Colleen, an understanding of human sexuality, we should never be afraid of talking about something that's beautiful and wonderful and God-given and, and how we relate to each other as men and women. And, and we're pretending that this is something shameful and it should not be. There's shameful behavior, mm -hmm. absolutely. But that we should speak to our children in an appropriate manner, as parents know, at an appropriate time, and introduce them into this conversation to be able then, in a way, to combat some of the falsifications that the children are inevitably going to see. Even in a Catholic system, mm -hmm. we live in a society. We cannot ignore it. You know, as uh, one friend, and I won't give you the example, I was with the, this beautiful family out for dinner, and this person who struggles with identity confusion was came into this restaurant, and one of the kids just said something, and it was innocent, but it's the idea that, you know, how do we help our children to understand how do we interact in society? How do we approach other human beings? How do we treat them with respect? How do we do, and that's very important as well. And, and so with that education, I would say, is what are they hearing in school? Sit down with the child. What did you hear? What textbooks are they using? Yeah. You know, I've been in some systems, you know, even uh, public and Catholic, where the textbooks themselves, because they're coming from public entities, you know, maybe someone hasn't done their due diligence and read all the pages, and you can see how language can easily easily be uh, crept in or what's the teacher saying and we know very sadly within our in our faith that not everybody believes what we're talking about within our catholic fold there's confusion there so there's a need for that kind of addressing with our faculties with our administrators and you know and the bishops themselves have been dealing with that and we've seen lawsuits because of that but again we are a religious institution Right, and as that, we have a we have a right as a religious institution to uphold our principles and to advance our principles and to assert those principles, mm -hmm. and we should never be ashamed of that. And so we need, as parents, what is being taught in your school system? What are you? What are your children hearing? Well, I think we're seeing that a little bit right now. Maybe less with what are what are your children actually hearing in schools? But we were talking about the lawsuits, and I know that some of them are coming for. I think one of the groups is Moms for Liberty, and there's these different groups that are coming up and saying please don't implement these in our schools. So can you address the lawsuits briefly? Um, what's going on with that? Which I know we don't have a list of states where it's effective. People can look up their own states, but just talking right. a little bit about that situation right now. Yeah, I, I'm so I'm very happy that these these lawsuits are, are briefs are being placed before the courts mm -hmm. because it's questioning, you know, mm -hmm. the implications of Title IX. And so even if you take away from Title IX, we have a current administration that is very aggressive you know, in, in advocating for these ideologies and these mm -hmm. positions. So, but in Title IX, now they have leverage. They have a federal regulation, you know, that now needs to be implemented. Mm -hmm. So what's happening legally is that states are challenging. So their their attorneys general are, are challenging. You have different groups like, you know, uh, the organization you mentioned. You have the bishops themselves, the conference of bishops in, in individual states. You have many other groups that mm -hmm. share these core values that we are talking about challenging the system and saying, you know, not only no, we do not want our children introduced to this ideology, mm -hmm. two, we're not going to implement this into our school systems, all right? Uh, you know, thirdly, we are a Catholic, a Christian, a religious institute. We will not adhere to this at all, even if we receive federal funding. So what does that mean? How does that apply? You know, are we going to lose the federal funding because we want to adhere to this? These are all things that are coming up in the lawsuits. When I think it's blocked, and I can't remember if it's 22 or 26 states right now, so it's currently not going into effect in those states. And then it's also blocked at specific schools across 44 states where I believe it's children from, I, like I said, I think the group's name was Moms for Liberty, but I forget. Okay. I read it like five days ago, and that's what I remember it being. Um, so it's creating this like hodgepodge of different areas where this is going to go into effect and where it's not. Right. Do you know if that's affecting, so if Title IX, those changes are on pause in those states, does that mean that how it affects the Affordable Care Act is also in pause in those states? Or is the Affordable Care Act 
a separate situation that's just going into effect across well, America? That's a very good question. And I have not found you know, enough information. I've been looking because I've been wanting to write on the subject. And it's very, very hard to find okay. because basically because the Affordable Care Act, I mean, stands on mm -hmm. its own. But because of the definition of sex discrimination mm -hmm. fits into its language, drawing from what this Title IX identify, it, it is affecting, you know, the Affordable Care Act. It is mm -hmm. affor affecting how it's implemented. Now, how and where and to what degree? I've been very, very unable to find you know, enough information, articles. Mm -hmm. I would think people would be writing on this because they would be concerned. And there maybe people are. I just haven't found those sources. So anyone's listening <laughs> that has seen something on this subject, I would be very interested in it because I do believe we need to address it. And we already see what's happening in, in the system, you know, and the challenges that we're finding in our, in our institutions mm -hmm. because of the way that they're approaching those with gender dysphoria how they're approaching those, you know, who seek a tra so-called transitioning. And, and as you said earlier, quoting other countries who are now stepping back and seeing statistics, the harm and the data that reveals a very different picture than what is being proposed by the liberal media here and by the Biden administration as something good for people. It's harmful, it's dangerous, and it's, it, and it's a violence against the human person. And, and, and that needs to be addressed. And if the Affordable Care Act is relying upon that definition, all the more reason we have to cha challenge Title IX. Mm -hmm. We have to challenge right. the language. Now, the real difficulty for us, Colleen, is that the federal government can exercise its own message, a message that I may not agree with it at all. The challenge then becomes for us is to fight against that, that message and how it imposes itself or has the potential to impose itself on our religious beliefs. And so we must stand up and we have to fight against this falsification, this very, very bad understanding of the human person and to correct. And it was so, so easy, really, uh, if we return back to a simple understanding, which is very easy to define by a simple test, male, female. And yes, we do know that there are some abnormalities. We do know that there are some conditions that cause some physical, you know, confusion. And yes, they're out there. But that's not how, again, if we do a simple test, we would begin to very X, clearly. X, 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 Y. <laughs> that's right. And so this is how we should define sex, male, female. Very easy to do. It would resolve all of these tensions. But that, again, is not what this is about, mm -hmm. ultimately. It's about, again, an ideology that's being imposed, being forced and pushed on the country. Well, not like you've made note of on the podcast before, when you get something into law, it's easy to then bring the culture in accord with that. That's so this is a way right. of normalizing right. it. And what concerns me, and that's for a different day, and I wrote something recently on this, it, mm -hmm. it does concern me of what you just said. And, and what we're seeing in the political parties in, mm -hmm. in the United States and how basically kind of giving the impression that certain things are subtle, we just accept them now. That's mm -hmm. false. We should never do that. If we considered the overturning of a very unjust law called Roe v. Wade and, and, and that Casey and all the other cases that came out as a result of that very bad law, then we Bill, would, but yeah. it became a law yeah. that today we would never have Dobbs mm -hmm. if it's settled. So no, we as a country never accepted this practice of abortion. And even though the media tries to paint a very different picture, they are in a way succeeding because it's convincing people more and more to accept abortion with limitation. We should never accept abortion. It's a violent crime against the human person and a violence against women. We should never accept that. And we'll have to do an episode on that at some point, definitely, and, right, as we get, right, especially as we get closer to right. the election. Because I think people, and I know we uh, are getting short on our time, but I, I think people can approach Title IX similarly. Mm -hmm. They could approach the Affordable Care Act similarly, in the mm -hmm. sense of those parts that we're concerned about, and just say, well, it's settled. It's policy. It's law. It's the federal government. You know, what can I do? That is the wrong stance. Mm -hmm. And that's what's allowed them to get the inroad they have because we haven't stood up against this. We haven't rejected it. And now what you're seeing with all these lawsuits now, what, what's the outcome of that? We'll find out in time. Mm -hmm. But whether the outcome is and not in our favor, we still need to fight against it. It's unacceptable. And the violence being done to our children, Colleen, is uh, it, it, the toll is there already. But we're gonna see this going forward. 
And uh, sure. the, the liberal media just will not publish it. Federal government under this current administration refuses to acknowledge the, the, the data that's out there and, and lies, you know, about the data. And so, and I, I say that strongly because that is the truth. I mean, you, they're, they're, they're not making things known that we're seeing in the studies and the surveys and the data and the scientific research that's out there that other countries are publicizing. Mm -hmm. And I do know that one country came here in the sense of their doctors, their team, to address this issue in the States. And so, and saying, what are you doing? This is what we've, we've published this, this is all, you know, uh, uh, very clear data. It's very, uh, uh, it's uh, been proven. And yet you're just gung ho on continuing to do this while others are saying, time out. Mm -hmm. what, what is, what gives? So Title IX exposes a more systemic issue. Mm -hmm. And that's what we got to get under, underneath that belly. But it, this gives us a chance to fight the good fight. Mm -hmm. And I would just uh, encourage people, and I know you're going to put this in the notes, is I love Bishop Burbage's uh, you know, pastoral on the ca uh, catechesis on the human person and gender ideology. I would strongly encourage. It's well done. It's short. It has a section for parents. Okay. Very well done. I'd encourage people to go to the National uh, Catholic Educational Association. I look at it because it's hard <laughs> to say sometimes. There's a great document there that was submitted to the Department of Education and other those involved, speaking on and actually using a lot of the information, the sections, pointing them out, raising questions. It'll help people understand. Also, the USCCB, Colleen, has have has several you know documents out there on this issue but more than that the catechesis mm -hmm. what does the church believe and teach about the human person then from that understanding how do we address gender identity confusion how do we help people who struggle with this confusion who have a contradiction between what their body says and what their mind or their heart may believe mm -hmm. there's a confusion and sometimes it's a very deep confusion, a very mental issue that needs to be addressed. And we're not helping people. And we have talked about that on the show before, too. So I'll link that as well down in the description, as well as all the documents that you mentioned. I do have one last question before we wrap up for today. So obviously, we've talked on the show before. We make in our here at the HLI, we see how American aid affects is pushing woke ideologies abroad. Correct. Do you happen to know if the changes to Title IX are going to affect right. American aid abroad? It's a very good question. And I have tried very hard to see, because Title IX deals specifically with education, mm -hmm. and even though you can read the document of 701 pages, you might be questioning, well, it's more than education here. But that's what it focuses on. That's where mm -hmm. it's meant to focus, on, mm -hmm. on, on civil rights and on education. However, as I just shared earlier about the Affordable Care Act and its understanding of sex and sex discrimination mm -hmm. affects health care. I would also believe that this document is being used mm -hmm. to reference other documents, other policies, other regulations that do affect how we as a country give international aid. Because you haven't found this. I have not found yet. it specifically. Okay. But I would be you pretty be good surprised. in believing <laughs> that it does. And okay. And why? Because we see how USAID, we mm -hmm. see how our support of the United Nations and their entities and their non-government organizations are at work around the world. Mm -hmm. All of that originates in our own policies, as we've talked about many times before with the National Security Memorandum 200, which we've talked about several times, mm -hmm. how that document has never been rejected by the federal government that advocates for the use of federal aid in different ways through the supporting of the United Nations and other entities to bring this message of population control. Mm -hmm. It's not a conspiracy. It's very clearly stated and, and documents public, it's there. It states exactly, and it is our state policy. Even under a more favorable pro-life uh, uh, administrations, it has had the difficult time of challenging those things. Under the Trump administration, we do know, remember that through the Mexico City policy, mm -hmm. that you know he strengthened it, the language of it, you know, but as an executive order, the moment that uh, Biden came into office, he rescinded that and put back into place what we have today. And so we do have the Hyde Amendment that does protect uh, the the use of, of, of federal funding, you know, taxes for the promotion of abortion. But it doesn't mean that it cannot be, uh, you know, 
filtered in in so many ways. We see it. We see mm-hmm. it firsthand around the world. And we also explain that in our Plant Parenthood ebook that we have, which I will also link in the description. Exactly. So, um, so I lots of resources say, today. <laughs> so if I were a betting man, no, I might lose my bet in a sense. So does it make direct reference? Mm-hmm. That would be a different question. But is it relying on the definition? Yes, I would say yes. Interesting. Well, I'm, again, if our audience happens to see something, I would be very happy to receive it because I love to write on it. I love to be able to expose a little more of the detail, you know, of why we should be concerned about Title IX or about any regulation that's being promulgated by the United States that has an impact on the dignity of life. Not that say, not saying that men and women's sports isn't a big issue, but this is, it's a much bigger issue than that. So obviously people are focusing on that and talking about that, which is good. It's raising awareness about something that people care about sports and they're you know, it has an emotional reaction. It's a good way to get people motivated to fight back against this, but also just, right. I'm glad that we had this conversation today to kind of expose our audience to the many other things that are going to be affected here, just to kind of have a right. big picture. So, exactly. and hopefully parents who are listening, yeah, just be careful as your kids are going back to school, look at what your school policies are and talk to your kids like father. You were saying. Exactly. And if you have any questions, I would encourage is to, especially as Catholics, what has the local diocese been saying? Mm-hmm. What are the policies of the local diocese? What is it said about education in the diocese? Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, so it's good to know that because maybe the school, and I'm, and I'm being very charitable here in, in a sense, maybe the school is not fully implemented those policies of the diocesan bishop, the diocese. Mm-hmm. That's a chance to have a conversation and to, and to, and to, and to find out why. Mm-hmm. And so now within the public school, which a good many of our families would be in, mm-hmm. is obviously, uh, you know, we have to navigate those waters very differently because we don't have a, a diocesan bishop, you know, standing with us in a Catholic system. We yeah. have a public system. But how can we have that conversation? And you have the ability to pull your child. You know, you, you, you are the primary educator of your children. And, and, that's, that's, and I've written about this several times, you know, about the importance of, of parents not giving their authority away. Mm-hmm. It's one thing to share it and to rely upon others to assist, but you should never give your own parental authority and your own parental rights should always be upheld. And by protecting your rights, you're protecting the rights of your children. That should never be violated. Exactly. Well said, Father. I can't really think of anything to follow that up. But thank you for coming on the podcast today and talking about this. Obviously, it's a very important topic, and I really hope it was helpful to our audience. If you have any questions on this topic or related topics, please put them in the comments because I would love to address it further. And there's so much we can unpack here in further episodes. So just let us know your questions and we'll try to cover them. And thank you, Father, for this conversation. Well, thank you, Colleen. Great to be with you again. Look forward to the next moment. I look forward to it as well. And to all of our listeners, please like, follow, and subscribe. I'll link some new eBooks in the description and on the end screen here. And keep on living the culture of life. God bless.